This is BBC News. I'm James Menendez. Our top stories this hour. Changing his story, President Trump says he decided to fire the FBI boss even before getting advice from the Justice Department. With his inauguration looming, Emmanuel Macron unveils his party's parliamentary candidates. More than half have never held office before. Europe's gorgeous song competition is this weekend, but what impact will Brexit have on Eurovision? And I'm Tanya Beckett. Zooming exports, crumbling classrooms, the paradox of Germany's lopsided economy. And will Iran stay open for business? Conservatives pledged to roll back Rouhani's reforms as companies nervously await next week's presidential election. Welcome to the program. Now, President Trump has insisted there was no collusion with Russia during his election campaign last year. In his first interview since firing the FBI director James Comey, Mr. Trump also told NBC News that his dismissal was about his performance as head of the Bureau and not about his investigation into alleged Russian meddling. He described Mr. Comey as a grandstander. He again called the investigation a made-up story, but also said he wanted it to be speeded up. From Washington, Laura Bicker. He's become more famous than me. Famous or infamous? When did Donald Trump decide to sack the towering figure from the FBI? This presidential handshake, not an act of friendship, it seems, but the beginning of the end for James Comey. He's a showboat, he's a grandstander. And it wasn't on the advice from the Deputy Attorney General, as the White House had stated. It came directly from the President. I was going to fire. Comey. My decision. It was not. You had made the decision before they came in. The I, I was going to fire Comey. And another apparent contradiction. The White House had claimed that Mr. Comey had little or no support within the FBI. The rank and file of the FBI had lost confidence in their director. I strongly not so, said the acting FBI director, who was sitting in for his sacked boss before the Senate Intelligence Committee. I can tell you that I hold Director Comey in the absolute highest regard. I have the highest respect for his considerable abilities and his integrity. I can tell you also that Director Comey enjoyed broad support within the FBI and still does. At the heart of this row is the alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Moscow. The president admits that Russia was on his mind when he decided to fire Mr. Comey. Regardless of recommendation, I was going to fire Comey, knowing there was no good time to do it. And in fact, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election. Donald Trump denies any collusion with Russia and insists that despite sacking the head of the FBI, he wants any inquiry done properly and quickly. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Washington. And we'll have more on that story a little later in the program. Now, as France gears up for the inauguration of Emmanuel Macron this weekend, the president-elect party has unveiled more than 400 candidates for next month's parliamentary elections. It's also changed his name to La République en marche, or the Republic on the move. Greg Dawson takes a look at some of the uh, candidates. These are the faces hoping to transform French democracy. And they come from a wide range of backgrounds including Marie Sarah, a former bullfighter, and Cedric Villani, winner of the Fields Medal, one of the highest honours in mathematics. At a tightly guarded press conference, more than 400 names were unveiled, with political inexperience the selling point. You can go and look in the history books. Never has a 13-month-old political movement in France been so courageous as to have 52% of people selected to become members of parliament, representing the nation, who don't have a political job on their CV or a political background involving political activism. In their search for candidates, President-elect Macron's party received more than 19,000 applications. They were whittled down by 1,700 telephone interviews. 52% are from civil society, and more than half of the candidates are women. 
Securing a majority in the parliament will be crucial for Emmanuel Macron's ability to push through reforms without seeking an alliance with other parties. After his decisive victory against Marine Le Pen, the pro-European centrist wants to rewrite labour laws to tackle mass unemployment. But he's still almost 150 names short if he wants a candidate for each French constituency. However, it's believed he's hoping to tempt defectors from the rival Republican Party. Ahead of being sworn in this weekend, Emmanuel Macron has promised to unite his divided country. Anything but another victory for his new party in June will make that challenge even tougher. Greg Dawson, BBC News. Let's take a look at some of the other stories making the news today. The U.S. will consider its own interests first as it reviews its climate change policy. That's according to Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. He told a meeting of the eight Arctic nations in Alaska that America wouldn't rush to make a decision. President Trump has expressed doubts over man's role in climate change and has said he may pull the U.S. out of the Paris Accord to fight it. Brazil says its national emergency over the Zika virus is now officially over. The threat from Zika, which is linked to the birth of babies with abnormally small heads, was at its peak last year as Brazil prepared to host the Olympic Games. The government says the number of cases dropped by 95% between January and April compared to the same period last year. Pope Francis is making a high-profile pilgrimage to the shrine at Fatima in central Portugal, where he plans to make two shepherd children saints. It's a hundred years since they reported seeing the Virgin Mary while tending their flock. Portugal has stepped up security and reimposed border control, suspending the Schengen Open Borders Pact. More than a million pilgrims are expected. Now, Chancellor Merkel will be hoping to win a fourth term when Germany goes to the polls this September. A regional election on Sunday could give some indication about how likely that is. Ms Merkel's party aims to win the state of North Rhine-Westphalia from the main opposition party. Jenny Hill reports from there. Not a vote cast yet, but there's something of the victory march in Angela Merkel's step. It's actually years since her party won here, polls suggest that might be about to change. It's not often a German regional election is considered so important. Angela Merkel knows that her party can take back the state and she has a very strong chance of taking the country from the autumn. But first she must persuade this town, this country. I think she really will be Chancellor again. She's very self-assured, reliable and calm. And because she's a woman, I like that. She promised too much and invited too many people without thinking. And too many of the wrong people came into the country. One man stands between Angela Merkel and victory. Martin Schulz's arrival on the German political scene gave his Social Democrat Party a boost in the polls. But even here, in SPD country, the so-called Schulz effect is wearing off. His approval ratings will only stabilize once he says very clearly what he wants to do. In the eyes of the voters, that hasn't happened yet. We need a clear program, clear policies on topics which matter to the electorate. And that includes a powerful industrial lobby. Germany's next chancellor will need the support of the Mittelstand, the country's family firms. We need to cut bureaucracy. We need a modern education system. We need support for businesses in the digital future. And we need better infrastructure in this region. Angela Merkel may seem reluctant to take the baton here, Make no mistake, this woman wants German voters to dance to her tune. Jenny Hill, BBC News, Rilon. Time for the business. Tanya's here. Good morning. And uh, you're talking Germany too. Yes, because there are some growth figures out this morning. Um, Europe's economic powerhouse will be releasing its GDP figures in a couple of hours. That's the size of the economy, and the question is, how fast is it growing? Well, growth is expected to have accelerated in the first three months of this year, fueled by global demand for the country's exports, cars and machinery and so on. 
but it's not caused necessarily all for celebration. And let's take a look at why. It has to do with what's called the trade surplus. Well, last year, Germany clocked up its biggest ever trade surplus. And that's the difference between what it exports and what it imports. In other words, it exports a lot more than it imports. At $275 billion, Germany has one of the biggest trade surpluses in the world. And this is a real source of tension with its neighbours and allies, looking at how much more Germany sells to these top econ economies uh, than it buys from them. As you can see, the US in particular has accused Germany of exploiting an undervalued euro to get an unfair trade advantage. Those are the differentials with each individual country. Well, an over-reliance on exports isn't the only problem. The European Commission says Germany is too frugal. It's saving too much and investing too little. Brussels wants to see some of that export wealth invested in the region's struggling economies. But many Germans think the spending should start closer to home. They feel Germany's glittering export success just doesn't stack up with the woeful state of some of the infrastructure at home. We'll be reporting from a Berlin school in dire need of some investment. And we're also taking a look at Iran. It holds its presidential elections next week, and it will be closely watched, of course, by hundreds of companies worldwide who are keen to do business there. The current president, Hassan Rouhani, has opened up Iran to foreign investment and has attracted some of the world's biggest firms. But conservative challengers have said that they would reverse that policy. Later today, the candidates hold the last in a series of presidential debates, which will focus on business, and the economy. We'll be hearing from an Iranian businessman on how he sees prospects within the country. And don't forget you can get in touch with me and the team. Um, we're on Twitter at BBC Tanya Beckett. James, back to you. Thank you. See you later. Now, Europe's most extravagant pop music competition, the Eurovision Song Contest, reaches its climax on Saturday. It's fair to say that the United Kingdom has not done well in recent years. But what effect will Brexit have? Even the Prime Minister has warned that British fans shouldn't expect too much. Steve Rosenberg is in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, where the contest is taking place. Love it or hate it? Here's one European institution the UK is remaining in for now. The Eurovision Song Contest. It's the final this Saturday in Kiev. Lucy Jones is flying the UK's flag. But will Brexit mean that Britain meets its Waterloo? Let's face it, in recent years it's been hard enough for the United Kingdom to get points from our European neighbours when we've been on speaking terms with them. But now that we're leaving the European Union in an atmosphere of acute disharmony, will that condemn the UK to eternal null point in Eurovision? Hey, 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 oh, hey, hey. They may be excited about Eurovision in Kiev, but Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May has warned that Brexit could scupper the UK's Eurovision party. Well, is the Prime Minister a Eurovision fan? I can't imagine her sat with her flag at home. Honestly, whatever happens, happens. Um, Brexit is so out of my hands and out of my control. For the EU, Brexit strikes a bum note. But the signs are that Europe hasn't fallen out of love with Britain. We've discovered that even the French love having the UK in Eurovision. Well, so that France won't come last. The France is very bad, but England is worse. And I am happy with it. And being happy is what Eurovision is all about. It's not the winning that counts. Just as well, the UK hasn't won the contest for 20 years. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Kiev. Stay with us here on BBC News. Still to come, remember the love locks of Paris. Well, thousands are now being auctioned to raise money for charity. You're watching BBC News. Uh, our main headline this hour. President Trump has changed his explanation about why he fired the director of the FBI, James Comey. He said he'd already decided to sack him before receiving advice from the Justice Department. 
Well, let's stay with that story. Let's talk to Thomas Mann, a resident scholar at the Institute of Governmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he joins us from there now. And good to have you with us here on BBC World News. And uh, what do you make of uh, President Trump's latest explanation about the uh, firing of James Comey? Perfectly in character. Uh, one should never be surprised by anything that President Trump says. Uh, the initial reactions to his stated explanation uh, were, were so disbelieving uh, that sort of eventually he got around to saying what was on his mind. This is not a man who thinks through uh, deeply decisions or presentations of decisions afterward. Uh, he may have thought, though, that uh, the sacking of uh, Mr. Comey would make this whole issue go away. But, I mean, it's, it's done the reverse, hasn't it? It's stirred the pot and, 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 and made this front-page news for the last few days. Of course. Why any sane person would believe that that would help um, Mr. Trump has zero experience in, uh, in government, uh, in anything outside of, of uh, his family business and celebrity TV, and he just really doesn't understand uh, the Constitution, the separation of powers, the, the nature of uh, how a president and other high-ranking public officials are uh, are accountable uh, for what they say and do. And yet, is there a case to be made for saying that Director Comey could have handled uh, this investigation, but also uh, Hillary Clinton's emails, the issue over that, could have handled uh, those things better? I'm not sure about the Russia investigation. There, there's not enough that's been revealed a bit uh, to know for sure other than the possibility he could have said more before the election. Yes, I, like many others, think he, he badly mishandled uh, the Hillary uh, Clinton email matter. I, but I do believe he's a man of integrity, he said so back then, and he thought he was doing the right thing to protect, to protect the reputation of the FBI, but uh, it uh, backfired on him. Uh, and is it also, yeah, and is it also possible that uh, President Trump acted out of frustration because there was no collusion with Russia and he's simply frustrated that this is dominating these early months of his administration? Oh, it's possible. It's possible, but there's quite a bit of uh, evidence uh, just sort of on the table already. Uh, and... I'll tell you, the, the failure of, uh, of Mr. Trump to release his tax returns to allow uh, the public to see if, uh, if there were any sort of financial arrangements with, uh, with Russia that, that might lead him to be more sympathetic and them to be sympathetic to, uh, to him. Uh, so... No, it's, it's hard to be, um, to be believing of anything the president says now. He's broken all records for falsehoods, uh, uh, and he's barely 115 days or 20 days into his presidency. This is uh, not a pretty sight. Certainly keeping us all on our toes. Thomas Mann at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, is Somalia on the cusp of a new era of prosperity and opportunity? The UN Secretary General says that after decades of conflict and instability, the conditions are now in place for Somalia to become a success story. He was speaking at an international gathering here in London. Somalia's president was also there and said his country has a golden opportunity to put its troubled past behind it. The BBC's Mary Harper has this report. The great and the good assembled for the third London conference, the latest in a long string of high-level gatherings that have tried to sort Somalia out since it collapsed into chaos 30 years ago. Delegates promised that this conference would be different, more than a talking shop, that Somalia would never again return to its terrible past. Well, I see international conferences as a process, not a product. 
where you deliver something right away. You agree on a set of procedures and set of uh, uh, steps and policies uh, and agreement to be implemented over a period of time. The conference pledged to help Somalia take responsibility for its own security, more resources and more joined up training for the army and police. Now, Somalia has outsourced its security to more than 20,000 African Union troops, U.S. drones, foreign advisors and private security companies. This conference has made ambitious commitments. A new security plan, one person, one vote elections in 2021 and a new deal for the economy. But delivery will be difficult, if not impossible. The worst drought in living memory didn't feature as a headline topic at the meeting. But delegates called for more international help and said they were fully mobilized to avert widespread famine. Mary Harper, BBC News. Talks on sport now.